Hey everyone, I noticed it's been taking me consistently longer and longer to make each new video for my channel. So to get this Hades review out in a more timely manner, I decided I am not going to make an overly edited montage for the intro. I'm leaving. Try and stop me. I'm here, father. You're going home. Oh no. I'll make it out of here yet. Take your time to do this! Come on out. Oh, oh no. Do you believe the time is terribly? Before we get started, I just want to say this review is pretty intensive and I'll be discussing a lot of different topics related to the game. I won't spoil any major story plot points or cutscenes, but you might see hidden weapons, alternate bosses, or late game music, in case you're looking to go in truly blind. Without further ado, here we go! In the name of Hades. I accept this message. I don't have an interesting angle to use when it comes to kicking off this review, so I'm just gonna be direct about it. Hades is absolutely fantastic. I mean, no surprise considering we're talking about super giant games here, but it feels like there are so many indie roguelikes popping up nowadays that I just can't get to all of them. And for a while, it felt like nothing could compete with Enter the Gungeon for the title of my favorite roguelike as if my personal favorite means anything to anyone other than myself. Even the fundamentals of Hades are fantastic. With just the satisfying combat and signature jams from Darren Korb, Hades would be worth the purchase, and they could have stopped there. But they obviously obviously didn't, Supergiant said, hey, what if we fill Hades with a bunch of characters from Greek mythology, referencing their history while also developing them into unique, charming, and just overall, not you, wacky and lovable fellas. And you know what? Let's throw in a story that brings those dang gamers to the verge of tears every time they hear... If you know, you know. Then they said, hey, let's throw in, oh, I don't know, thousands of voice lines so practically every character can react to gifts, win streaks, other characters, story moments, weapons, and whether or not Zagreus has eaten a burger in the last 20 minutes. Hypnos eyed the brown McDonald's bag, hidden under the young prince's robes as he emerged from the pool of sticks. You could ask him if he had a few extra fries to spare. At this point in development, I imagine the programmers and writers have now fallen asleep in their chairs from exhaustion until someone across the office just yells, We should add fishing. Game of the year goes to Hades. My only complaint is that I wish I could catch more fish. You have my rod of fishing. Now have this. Oh. All right, let's catch some fish. And if you think the game stops at fishing, you'd be sorely mistaken. As you make ample progress in the game and finish purchasing the various run benefits from the house contractor, Hades turns into an interior design simulator. Yeah, I think the lounge deserves an aquarium and a disco ball. Oh yeah, I think those flowers are gonna look great in that corner, Nick. I mean, it's only natural to put endlessly falling flower petals in the hallway as you emerge from the pool of sticks. Oh, and don't forget the towels. We wouldn't want anyone tracking blood on the new rugs I just bought. Who made this game? Alright, since Hades is an action roguelike and not entirely a visual novel, even though it kinda is, I should probably talk about what it's like to actually play it. Well, after I do the popular spiel about how over 70% of the people watching my videos aren't subscribed, so I'd really appreciate it if you subscribed because it's free and it really helps out the channel since I only upload like once a month. Ha, <laughs> yeah, imagine if I did something like that. In case you aren't familiar with anything relating to Hades, allow me to give you a super quick crash course. You're Zagreus the son of Hades, and you're having a little temper tantrum, so you want to bust out of Tartarus and go hang with your cool god family on Olympus. You pick your weapon, head out, and are immediately presented with a weapon upgrade or a boon from one of the various Olympian gods. These boons can change your damage output, give you debuffs to apply on enemies, or even provide powerful special abilities. You then journey through each floor of the underworld, fighting enemies and bosses, collecting more upgrades to strengthen yourself before trying to kill your dad who also happens to be the 
the god of the underworld. Oi, I'm trying to get out of the underworld, mate. Hey, trying to get out of the underworld, I'm dead. Did you really just- Oh, oh fuck! Die at any point in the run and you'll get sent straight back to the house of Hades to start all over again. However, starting all over again doesn't feel like an issue. In fact, that's the whole idea of the roguelike genre. Hades excels in this regard because it feels like a game with near infinite variety. I mean, basically every good roguelike feels like this, but I think that's what demonstrates great game design fundamentals and execution. In Hades, you are presented with six weapons, with each of those weapons also having four variations to choose from. These 24 choices alone support a range of incredibly varied approaches to combat, from frenzied close quarters melee to calculated long distance archery, but the classic roguelike addition of choice and random chance just dumps an insane amount of replayability into the mix. For example, you might be inflicting poison with super fast blows from the gauntlets, and in another run you could be tossing your freezing spinny shield while you constantly pulse damage, Ooh, or you could use a weakening multi-shot bow point blank as a fucking shotgun, have a bunch of homing lasers just rip apart the final boss, or die because he accidentally picked the weird spread shot modifier for the railgun without reading what the upgrade does. I am still more than capable of besting you. Point is, I haven't had very many runs feel similar in over 50 hours. Now, if the only way to get stronger was on a run-to-run -run basis, beating the final boss would be really hard. Hades is technically a rogue light, because you can get permanent upgrades that carry over between runs that make it easier to clear rooms or get rarer abilities. But I call it a rogue like because not many people know the difference. I know you're getting ready to leave that comment detailing the full history of the genre and the blatant misuse of the term, but they called it a godlike roguelike in the trailer. That's a good tagline. Take it up with Super Giant. Anyway, the reason I mention this is because I love the way Hades handles the amount of power it gives to the player. In some roguelikes, for example, Enter the Gungeon, Risk of Rain 2, and Binding of Isaac, you can unlock new characters or weapons, but you aren't given nearly as much to upgrade as you are in Hades. With just the mirror alone, you can upgrade stats like max health, revives, dashes, damage dealing, rarity percentages, rerolls. Enter the Gungeon goes, you want more max health? Why not try killing the boss without getting hit, dumbass? After you invest in the various weapons, level your keepsakes, and max out the mirror, finishing a run becomes considerably easier, which is where the heat system comes in. Once you've cleared the game for the first time, the Pact of Punishment allows you to increase the difficulty anywhere from, yeah, just a little teensy bit harder, to, oh fuck, oh shit. Mom, can you pick me up? I wanna go home. Yes, Dionysus, please give me hangover on my attack, and please don't erase it. No! You can make enemies have more health or deal more damage, force yourself to become a speedrunner or die, and even make the bosses harder. One fish, two fish, one boss. Oh shit. The Pact of Punishment adds an enormous level of depth that lets you make each run as easy or hard as you want, with new rewards and challenges for those confident enough to keep turning up the heat. It's a perfect way to counteract both the personal skill and the persistent upgrades each player develops over time, but gives full freedom on how hard they want their experience to be. Hades also includes a god mode to make things more casual, which I think is a really smart move since the towering difficulty of roguelikes can and often be daunting for those new to the genre. I felt right at home with the intense and often punishing gameplay loop, but I'm heavily biased towards action-packed roguelikes to begin with, so it's nice to see that Supergiant put a lot of effort into making the game accessible and enjoyable for the widest possible audience. Hell, I'm still too stupid to not die in the first room of Spelunky. Stop here and Hades would be a really good game, but as you probably know from the ungodly amount of time left in this video, it doesn't stop here. Everything else takes it from a really good game to a really good game. That second really is bolded, italicized, and underlined in the script. When it comes to writing, Hades blew my expectations for a roguelike out of the water so hard that any nearby fish fucking died because it took them so long to fall back down from the sky. I just didn't expect it. 
at all. I booted it up ready for an intense action roguelike, and I ended up with the most endearing cast of characters I've seen in any game in a while. The thousands of fully voiced interactions between Zagreus and the Olympian gods, bosses, side characters, and this fucking rock are a joy to listen to. Again, this is the level of quality and care you'd expect from a 100 hour RPG or AAA story game jammed into an indie title. The game released out of early access and they said, you know what, let's put it on sale for $20. If anyone at Supergiant is watching this, I have a suggestion for your marketing team. You gotta make the game cost more! You make the game more expensive! But now that I'm done talking about the gameplay, let's talk about the gameplay. When you get down to it, this game is a visual novel and dating sim. Each run of the roguelike is just an excuse to collect bottles of nectar so you can give them to people for special dialogue. You also get to see the tales of characters like Orpheus and Eurydice unfold alongside Zagreus' main story. But here's the thing, why did no one teach me in school? that Achilles and Patroclus were super gay. Let's go! Sisyphus has a face carved into his boulder, and he calls it Boldy. It has its own portrait art, and you can give it gifts. Pack it up, boys. Video games are done. The more I played Hades, the more I came into each session being just as excited to hear new lines of dialogue as I was to play the actual game itself. The quality and amount of writing isn't where the attention to detail stops, though, because details are everything when it comes to Hades. The gameplay puts it at A tier, the story and writing bump it up to S, and the extra care woven throughout every aspect of its design picks it up from the tier list and tosses it up onto Olympus where it belongs above the ranking standards of mere mortals. To explain what I mean in a general sense, there's so much stuff that didn't need to be included in Hades at all. So many visual gags, references, secrets, and lines of dialogue that many players won't ever discover or notice, but the fact that they were included anyway adds so much charm to the game's world. I feel like this is a weird concept to approach in a review, and it's hard to explain the exact feeling I'm trying to convey here, but after like 30 or so hours of play, Zagreus started calling the Lernaean Bone High Hydra Lurney, and ever since that moment, his health bar and Vanquish screen updated to call him Lurney. The third boss fight takes place in a big stadium filled with shades cheering for Theseus and Asterius, and if you walk to the back of the stadium after the fight, there's a singular shade with a Zagreus banner, who Zagreus will say a thank you line to in every run. Hello, supportive shade. That was for you, good shade. Thanks for believing in me, my good shade. You tell me that that isn't the cutest shit ever. Hermes literally has a voice line when you pick up his boon to react to you turning on the in-game timer. You know, cuz, since you're timing yourself, in case you haven't noticed, it doesn't count against you when we stop to have these chats. Insisted on that little rule myself. Every secret I discover, no, just everything that happens in this game makes my experience feel one of a kind, like I've unearthed some hidden cutscene no one else has found, but plenty of people definitely have. But the game doesn't even stop there. Since we're already on Olympus, what feature that I haven't talked about already could possibly make Hades powerful enough to overthrow all the other gods and establish itself as the one true king of roguelikes? Well, if you know anything about my interest in video games, you might know where this is going next. Dear Darren Korb, Who are you and what real life god of the underworld did you sign your soul to in order to compose a phenomenal soundtrack for Hades while also being the singing voice of Orpheus and the voice of Zagreus, the main character, the dude who has the most voice lines in the entire game? And Skelly! So the Hades soundtrack, it's kinda like orchestral rock, with a hefty dose of cool instruments to really push that Greek mythology base, but this is also a modern action roguelike about the underworld we're talking about. So sometimes it's hard rock, and sometimes it feels like metal, and I honestly can't picture anything better to fit this game's visual style and high octane gameplay. Let's just go with exactly what Darren Korb calls it. Mediterranean prog rock Halloween music. You've got your intense bass, guitar, synths, and whatever those ancient sounding instruments are for floor and boss themes, which are then contrasted with these beautiful vocal tracks sung by Orpheus and Eurydice that often only include one or two instruments like the lyre. 
normally I play this song on a balama. It's what it's written on and what I played on on the soundtrack. It's a sort of long-necked Turkish instrument. You see, when I said liar, I actually meant the name of the instrument. He just said that I definitely knew about. The Hades leitmotif is found in various places throughout the game, and while it's only a short four-note progression in its most basic form, it spans so many different emotions. From the triumphant yet sinister main theme, to a high-tempo, time-signature-shifting boss theme to get you fired up, <laughs> to literally the complete opposite, the You Died theme. Did you think you were hot shit so you turned up the heat too much? <laughs> and then you went, nah, I got this, and made the bosses harder and... Okay, I'm just gonna try to beat Hades on this run, no heat. I'm gonna say this really quietly because I don't know if it's considered a spoiler, but in the Extreme Measures Phase 3 Hades fight. This is a real boss song now. It has enough guitars in it. And I didn't even mention the art design, but I feel like it speaks for itself. I mean, you've been watching gameplay in this video for long enough to be able to tell how fantastic Hades looks. Each environment is drawn to make it feel like you're playing inside a work of art. The combat and character animations are powerful and satisfying, and the character portraits are, ooh, gorgeous. Yeah, I like girls. Yeah, Megara's mine. What are you gonna do about it? Come down here to the underworld and fight me? Oh. Shit. Wait, 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 let me grab this spitty shield first. I've played a lot of roguelikes. From the grotesque, twisted caverns of Binding of Isaac to the over-the-top absurdity of Enter the Gungeon, each one does something special to stand apart from the rest. Slay the Spire took the genre in a whole new direction by switching the typical high-octane action combat to a deck-building card game. Risk of Rain 2 allows you to push runs infinitely to the point of pure frame-dropping madness and has amazing online co-op. And I haven't even played World of Horror or Going Under yet, but just, you can see the difference. You got a one-bit, point-and-click RPG horror roguelike right next to a... I don't know, I just gotta play Going Under. I should honestly just make a full-fledged video about how much I love these dang games. All of this brings me to how Hades stubbornly fights for the spot of my favorite roguelike. Sure, games like Enter the Gungeon and Risk of Rain 2 have tidbits of hidden lore, but I've never played a roguelike with such attention to story, characters, and world building. Hades' base gameplay is so addicting and replayable that it doesn't even need a story, and yet it wouldn't be the same without it. To me, there's one easy gauge to tell whether or not a roguelike is special. Long matches in multiplayer games can be taxing, and I've experienced many a loss where me and the boys will say, yeah, that's it for tonight. In single player games, sometimes rage quits happen, or maybe a game can only hold your attention for an hour or two in each play session. The entire concept of a roguelike, of losing progress and starting all over, is brutal. But if I can play one run of Hades for over an hour just to die to the final boss when I was that close, and I'm then forced to start back from square one, but my brain goes, hey, I wanna do it again. <laughs> That's the mark of a great roguelike, and Hades exceeds that by leaps and bounds. It expands on the possibilities of the genre by building motives driven by characters and story rather than only using the excitement of beating the game to keep you coming back. I don't want to beat Hades just because I get a little pop-up saying I won or because the fish on the surface sell for a lot. I want to beat Hades because there's always more gifts to give, more dialogue to read, more secrets to uncover, and more furniture to buy. Upon my initial purchase, Hades enticed me with its style and basically just the fact that it was an action roguelike. And while its incredibly robust and addicting gameplay loop is all I needed to get started, the ironic surprise of an underworld brimming with life is what made Hades really stick. The little details continue to bring a smile to my face each time I play, and sometimes the story, hell, the music alone can make my eyes well up. It not only captivated my heart, I think it's taken the crown for my favorite roguelike. And hey, 
With the previous reigning champ being a game where you can shoot guns at a dragon made of bullets while playing as a bullet, those were some big shoes to fill. Thank you for watching this video. I honestly didn't think I could review a single game for this long, so I spent some time searching the script to make sure the amazing and incredible word count didn't get too out of hand. If you enjoyed it, consider subscribing and checking out my Patreon, which is a great way to support me and get access to cool exclusive videos and Discord chats and you know the drill. See you next time.